Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've joined us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled Resting in Christ. And this lesson doesn't sound very much like resting. Restless and rebellious. It's lesson number two for July 10 of 2021. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our loving Father, as we consider now the experience of the children of Israel between Egypt and Jericho, what incredible experiences they were. So many sad stories of the things that, the good opportunities they had, but which they turned into bad opportunities because of their rebelliousness. Help us now to see what we can learn from their mistakes is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When the children of Israel left Egypt after those amazing displays of God's power in the ten plagues, they thought that in a short time they would be in the land of Canaan. Under normal circumstances, this is important to remember in light of all this, under normal circumstances, if they had taken the direct route to Canaan, they could have been there in about two weeks. Yeah. Even with that huge multitude. It's not that far. What actually happened, and of course you all know this, was they found themselves at the foot of Mount Sinai and lived in tents there for a year. Natural human restlessness soon led to rebellion. After having God speak to them directly from the top of the mount and being directed by Moses under the guidance of God to build the tabernacle, and begin their close relationship to God, who fed them every day, lighted their way, protected them from the sun's heat, etc., they were finally ready to move on. Jim? Numbers 11, verses 1 to 3. The people began to complain to the Lord about their troubles. When the Lord heard them, he was angry and sent fire on the people. It burnt among them and destroyed one end of the camp. And the people cried out to Moses for help. He prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a second. The Lord burned one end of the camp? Well, that's what... <laughs> that's what it says, isn't that's it? That's right. Basically. Okay. It, it, another way you could say g g the Lord permitted the uh, one end of the camp to be to burn. Yeah. Just like uh, with. He stopped protecting them. Yeah. When Jeremiah he's, he says, "I'm going to bring the Babylonians." No, the Babylonians are going to come if you don't get, get your act uh, yeah. straightened out. But uh, unfortunately, they translated as God's going to uh, threaten. That, that was their. That was what they believed. They believed if something is supernatural happens, you can't explain it. That was the must be God. Exactly the way the ancients thought. Okay, we're back. It, it burned. Where, where was I at? Verse people two. cried out to Moses for help. He prayed to the people, the Lord, and the fire died down. So the place was named Ter Tabura. Tabura. Yeah. Tabura, because there the fire of the Lord burnt among them. American Bible Society. Okay, what do you think is happening here? Is God becoming irritated and upset and angry? Or in the context of the great controversy, when people rebel against God, is he forced to allow Satan to have access to them? I agree. And that's because they don't want to listen to him. If you go through the Old Testament, God, his complaint is, you don't listen. You don't listen. Unfortunately, many times it's translated, you don't obey. Yeah. No. If you don't listen, you don't want to take instructions, so you've chosen to, to not take my listening, listening for me, you can fall, suffer the consequences of, of your loyalties and, and to somebody being, else. Yeah, being led by another power. Yeah. Numbers 11, 4 to 5. They weren't done complaining. The next complaint was about food. Carrie? There were some foreigners traveling with the Israelites. They had a strong craving for meat, and even the Israelites themselves began to complain. If only we could have some meat. Okay, let's stop for a second. The children of Israel had a lot of flocks and animals. We don't know how many they actually had when they took, that they took with them, 
But we know that they were offering sacrifices every day at the temple when they got it going there, the tabernacle. They had animals. So it's not like they didn't have any meat. They just didn't have as much as they wanted. Yeah. Okay? Uh, in Egypt, we used to eat all the fish we wanted, and it cost us nothing. Remember the cucumbers, the watermelons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic we had. But now our strength is gone. There is nothing at all to eat. Nothing but this manna day after day. Manna was like small seeds, whitish yellow in color. It fell on the camp at night along the dew, along with the dew rather. The next morning the people would go around and gather it, grind it or pound it into flour, then boil it and make it into flat cakes. It takes, it tastes, now let me start that again, it tasted like bread baked with olive oil. That wouldn't be bad. Where do we, where do we know, know it was seeds? Right there, we read that. I know we did, but I've never heard that before, that I really? can recall. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, I've heard uh, other stuff elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever, it doesn't matter. I just thought, well, where did that come from? Uh, Moses heard all the people complaining as they stood about in groups at the entrances of their tents. He was distressed because the Lord was angry with them. And he said to the Lord, why have you treated me so badly? Okay, now we're going to find out a little bit later here that there's a very specific statement about what God does when he's, ang when he's quote, angry. When he's, quote, angry. So here we see what's happened. Yeah. He's letting them go. He's letting them experience their own experiences because they don't want to do what he wants. So he said, well, okay. If you have to have it your way, go ahead. Why are you displeased with me? Why this is Moses talking to the Lord now. Yes. Why have you given me the responsibility for all these people? I didn't create them or bring them to birth. Why should you ask me to act like a nurse and carry them in my arms like babies all the way to the land you promised <laughs> to their ancestors? Moses really wrapping it on, isn't he? Yes. Where could I get enough meat for all these people? They keep whining and asking for meat. I can't be responsible for all these people by myself. It's too much for me. If you are going to treat me like this, take pity on me and kill me so that I won't have to endure your cruelty any lo longer. Boy, wow. He felt at home with God. That's quite a statement from Moses, isn't it? Yes, it is. Could they really long for the lives they were living back in Egypt? I mean, think about it. Had they forgotten about the slavery they were living under? They must have. All they seemed to be able to think about was the good food there was, there was available there. Yeah. So how did God respond? Well, Numbers 11, 16 to 33. We're just going through the stories here. The Lord said to Moses, Assemble 70 respected men who are recognized as leaders of the people, Bring them to me at the tent of my presence and tell them to stand there beside you. I will come down and speak with you there and I will take some of the spirit I've given you and give it, give it to them. Then they can help you to bear the responsibility for these people and you will not have to bear it alone. Now tell the people, purify yourselves for tomorrow. You will have meat to eat. The Lord has heard your whining and saying that you wished you had some meat and that you were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will have to eat it. You will have to eat it. You will have to eat it not just for one or two days or five or ten or even twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your ears. <laughs> this is God talking. Until you are sick of it. This will happen because you rejected the Lord who is here among you and have complained to him that you should never have left Egypt. Moses said to the Lord, here I am leading 600,000 people. That's just 600,000 men. And you say that you will give them enough meat for a month? Could enough cattle and sheep be killed to satisfy them? Are all the fish in the sea enough for them? Is there a limit to my power, the Lord answered? You will soon see whether what I have said will happen or not. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. Had said. He assembled 70 of the leaders and placed them around the tent. This would be the God's tent, the tabernacle, in the middle of the, of the assembly. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him. 
He took some of the spirit he had given to Moses and gave it to the 70 leaders. When the spirit came down on them, they began to shout, to shout like prophets, but not for long. Two of the 70 leaders, Eldad and Medad, had stayed in the camp and had not gone out to the tent. There in the camp, the spirit came on them, and they, be, they too began to shout like prophets. A young man ran out to tell Moses what Eldad and Medad were doing. Then Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' helper since he was a young man, spoke up and said to Moses, Stop them, sir. Moses answered, Are you concerned about my interests? I wish that the Lord would give his spirit to all his people and make all of them shout like prophets. Then Moses and the seven leaders, the Israel, went back to camp. Suddenly, the Lord sent a wind that brought quails from the sea, flying less than a meter above the ground. They settled on the camp and all around it for many kilometers in every direction. So all that night, all that day, all night, and all the next day, the people worked catching quails. No one gathered less than a thousand kilograms. Whoa! They spread them out to dry all around the camp. While there was still plenty of meat to, for them to eat, the Lord became angry with the people and caused an epidemic to break out among them. Okay. What is happening in this story? Think we can explain it? Well, they're hungry for meat. Yeah. It, do, it turns out that there are certain times in the year, there are twice a year at least, there are major migrations of birds down to that territory from, from Europe to Africa for the, for the certain seasons, and then back again, and back and back and back and forth. So it's, it's, this kind of thing could happen because of a bird migration. That would be part of the answer. Well, they would try to uh, dry them out, and maybe smoke them or whatever, but did they complete the job then? Yeah, exactly. The miracle that took place in order to satisfy their desire for meat is incredible. If we understand the weights and measures that Moses uses, uses here, each person gathered enough quail to provide an enormous supply of meat for a long time. But what was the problem? Of course, they had no refrigeration of any kind. And very soon, unless the meat was carefully and thoroughly like smoked or dried, soon the meat became bad and an epidemic broke out among them. So, now let's get back to the real issue. What was the real issue in this whole story? The real issue wasn't meat. They had their flocks and herds and could at times eat meat, but they had been living in tents for over a year. They expected to be in the land of milk and honey by this time. They were ready, they were really complaining about God's leadership. It's so easy to forget the bad times and remember the good times in our past. And so there's a story told, overheard from a group of senior citizens. The older we get, the better we were. <laughs> what does that mean? You tend to remember the good times and forget about the bad times unless they were really bad and really stand out in your mind. It's easy, you would like to remember the good times and you'll like to sort of forget about the bad times. So the older we get, the better we were. But it wasn't only the people who were complaining. Numbers 12, 1 to 3. Moses had married a Cushite woman, and Miriam and Aaron criticized him for it. They said, Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he also spoken through us? The Lord heard what they said. Moses was a, was a humble man, more humble than anyone else on earth. Okay, I'm going I'm to stop there and ask a question. Does that sound, who, first of all, who wrote this passage? <laughs> it probably wasn't Moses. It was uh, Moses. Yeah, but if, if who, somebody added that there, uh, that question about Moses was a humble man. It's in parentheses. No, I, I, that's, think he did? I think, I think he did it. Yeah. But, well, and here's the reason. It was not popular for someone to be humble. They wanted a military leader, a general who would stand out and conquer their enemies and so forth. So Moses says, I was humble. I'm sorry, but I was humble. And, and you know, he had, he had, he had herded, herded sheep for 40 years. Yeah. You know? 
But they sound in a way like spoiled kids in a way. Too. Yeah. Would you believe spoiled kids is yeah. hardly the answer. So, what do we know about Zipporah? Zipporah was a, was was married uh, was Moses's wife. She was also a descendant of Abraham. How do we know that? Well, Abraham, after Sarah died. Here, what were, who were the Midianites? Carrie. I'm reading after uh, Genesis chapter twenty-five, verse one. After Sarah's death, Abraham married another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Okay, so that explains something about Midian. Oh, Midian, go ahead. Yes, Exodus 3, uh, 1. One day while Moses was taking care of the sheep and goats of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian... So where did he come from? This was Midian. Yeah. Jethro was a priest of Midian. Who was Midian? A descendant of Abraham. Okay? He led the flock across the desert and came to Sinai, the holy mountain. That's from the Good News Bible. So, the real issue here with Miriam and, and Aaron was the fact that Moses had listened to his father-in-law and followed good advice to share his responsibilities with others without consulting Miriam and Aaron. And look again at, at Numbers 11, where we already read that, 17 and 18, 24 and 25. So, what was the problem? Well, this was a little bit of race problem because the Midian, the territory of Midian is way down there, just a short distance across the, the bottom end of the Red Sea there from Africa. And so when they said, when the, when the verse says she was Cushite, what did Cushite mean? Do you remember? A Gentile, I guess. Well, no. Where's Cush? I guess. That's another, that's another word for Ethiopia. Oh, okay, yes. So probably there was some, uh, you know, African blood in that line. I, I'm just guessing from what it says. Remember right back up there we read that. Um, and hadn't those two been sharing some of the load of Moses? Yeah, see, back here in Numbers 12, 1, Moses had married a Cushite woman. Okay. So there's the idea there. Those two. Sheba came. So what was supposed to be the role of Aaron and, Mir and Miriam at that point? Moses answered, No, Lord, please, uh, no, Lord, no, I'm sorry, no, Lord, please send someone else. Remember, the Lord is telling him, I want you to go back to Egypt and lead the children out of Egypt, the children of Israel out of Egypt, right? And Moses says, Please, Lord, no, please, not me, not me, not me. At this, the Lord became angry with Moses and said, What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Remember, Moses said, well, man, I, I haven't been speaking Egyptian for 40 years. In fact, he is now coming to meet you and would be glad to see you. You can speak to him and tell him what to say. I will help both of you to speak, and I will tell you both what to do. Okay, if you had there that specific direction by God, would you dare to say no? No. Well... Micah 6, 4, I brought you out of Egypt. I rescued you from slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to lead you. So what was God's plan here? To share the work. These three brothers and sister, two brothers and a sister were supposed to be the leaders. Yeah. And can you think of an example when Miriam was the leader? You remember what happened right after they crossed the Red Sea? Miriam led all the women into songs oh. of praise. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, Numbers 12, 4 to 13. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, I want the three of you to come out to the tent of my presence. They went, and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud, stood at the entrance of the tent, and called out, Aaron, Miriam. 
I don't know if you remember, Dr. Maxwell used to talk about this story. He said, I, I wonder how, 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 how their blood pressure was doing. God is standing. I want the three of you to stand right over there. Aaron, <laughs> Miriam. <laughs> we'll catch your attention. <laughs> this is God speaking and everybody listening too, I'm sure. The two of them stepped forward and the Lord said, now hear what I have to say. When there are prophets among you, I reveal myself to them in visions and speak to them in dreams. It is different when I speak with my servant Moses. I have put him in charge of all my people, so I speak to him face to face clearly and not in riddles. He has even seen my form. How dare you speak against my servant Moses? The Lord was angry with them, and so he departed. Okay, I'm going to interrupt right there. This is one of the very earliest places in the Old Testament. There are many of them, but people seem to completely ignore these things. But this is one of the very earliest ones. The Lord was angry with them, and so what does he do? Does he burn them up? Does he zap them? He departed. He departed. And the cloud left the tent. Miriam's skin was suddenly covered with dreadful excuse me, dreaded disease, and turned as white as snow. When Aaron looked at her and saw that she was covered with the, the, with the disease, he said to Moses, Please, sir, do not make us suffer this punishment for our foolish sin. Now this is a case of, think about this, older sister and older brother, please, little brother, <laughs> please to the Lord for us. <laughs> you think a little bit of the family dynamics here. Don't let her become like something born dead with half as its flesh eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, O oh God, heal her. Good News Bible. This is one of the earliest verses in the Bible that show that when God is so-called angry, he steps back and leads us to the consequences of our own behavior, or even leaves us in the hands of the devil. It is interesting to notice in this passage that Miriam's name is mentioned before Aaron's. Why do you think that is? In the ancient patriarchal system, it was common to mention the male's name first. But Miriam was probably the one complaining about Zipporah first. Furthermore, if Aaron had been struck with leprosy, he would not have been able to serve as high priest until he was fully recovered. So, in our day, we hear many people complaining about church leadership. Shouldn't we be praying for them instead? Even when we disagree with them? Probably true. A more important question is, why can't God speak to all his people as he did to Moses? Clearly and face to face instead of in riddles. It is important to notice in 1 Kings 19.20, let's look at that really quick. Elisha then left his ox and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah, Elijah answered, All right, go back. I'm not stopping you. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. I got the wrong verse here. Then um, It's actually, well, no. The verse is, is a little further down where it talks about the still small voice. A little further back up, I'm sorry, where it talks about the still small voice. It wasn't the wind, earthquake, or fire that Elijah needed to listen to. Why is it that many of us think that God needs to appear in power before we're ready to respond to him? And thus we are prevented from having the very relationship that he wants with us. Why do others simply ignore every effort God makes to communicate with them? Is that an example where it says God is not in the earth wind, he's not in the yeah. earthquake, and he's not in the fire? Yep. The children of Israel soon arrived on the very border, border of the land of Canaan. Their hopes were high. God, it seemed, was ready to lead them into the land. But there was a delay. Why were the spies sent in to check out the land? Compare the following two passages. Numbers 13, 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, Choose one of the leaders from each of the twelve tribes and send them as spies to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. Now, who was giving the direction there? God was. The Lord said to Moses, right? Yeah. 
Okay, Jim, you want to read the next one there? Deuteronomy. Deut Deuteronomy 1, 19b to 32. Then we reached Kadesh Barnea. I said, you have now come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God, the God of our ancestors, is giving us. Look, there it is. Go and occupy it as he commanded. Do not hesitate or be afraid. Okay, so let's, let's, let's see this picture very clearly before we move on. They're standing on the border of the land of Canaan. They can see it. There it is. They can see it in the distance, the land of Canaan. Okay, Moses said what to them? Go and occupy it as God commanded. Do not hesitate or be afraid. And what happened? But you came to me and said, let us send men ahead of us to spy out the land so that they can tell us the best route to take and what kind of cities are there. Okay, so whose idea was it to send in the spies? The people. Hmm. Yeah, collective, collective ignorance, perhaps. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. That seemed a good thing to do. I selected 12 men, one from each tribe. The Good News Bible. Was God consulted at that point? Not no record there. We don't have any record of it. Mm -hmm. Seemed like a good idea, Moses said. But he, earlier he says, don't hesitate, just yeah. go on in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If they had said right at that point in time, well, we trust in God, we'll move forward, let God guide us, they would have been in the land of Canaan. You know, no more than a little over a year since they left Egypt. So who was it that decided that they needed a report from spies before they entered the land? And what was that spy's report after 40 days wandering around the land? Kerry? I'm reading from Numbers chapter 13, 27 through 33. They said to Moses, we explored the land and found it to be rich and fertile, and here is some of its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and their cities are very large and well fortified. Even worse, we saw the descendants of the giants there. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for just a second. I want you to pay very attention. This is what kind of land? Fertile. Very large, well fortified, fertile, right? Yeah. Okay, move on. Amalekites live in the southern part of the land. Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And Canaanites live by the Mediterranean Sea and along the River Jordan. Caleb silenced the people who were complaining against Moses and said, We should attack now and take the land. We are strong enough to conquer it. But the men who had gone with Caleb said, No, we are not strong enough to attack them. The people there are more powerful than we are. So they spread a false report amongst the Israelites about the land they had explored. They said the land doesn't even produce enough to feed the people who live there. Okay, hold on. What kind of people are living there? Giants. Giants, yeah. <laughs> what, 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 what did they say about the land? It was fertile. very fertile. And now what are they saying? It's gone bad. <laughs> I mean, this is a self-contradictory report. Yes. Just blatantly contradictory. We've kind of gotten used to the idea of contradictory for sports, don't we? <laughs> we live in a sea of yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, everyone we saw was very tall, and we even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. We felt as small as grasshoppers, and that is how we must have looked to them. So how can you say that in the same breath you're saying the land doesn't even produce enough food to pe feed the people who live there? Yeah. Do we know anything about Anak before? I mean, were there descendants of these people? Yes. That didn't lose yeah. all their height? Yeah. Yeah, they were. I mean, think about uh, um, um, David and Goliath. Yeah. yeah that was, so. you know, what, what was that? That's 400 years later. No, I figured it was like some of the diseases we get occasionally here. Yeah, well, a whole no, I don't, huh? I don't think this was a disease condition. They were... They were, they were in good shape. Yeah. At first it seemed like the spies' report was an excellent one, but then ten of the spies began to complain. So what happened next? 
Numbers 14, 1 to 10. All night long, the people cried out in distress. What do they hear? All they heard was the bad part. Yeah. They complained about, against Moses and Aaron and said, it would not have been better to die in Egypt, Egypt or even here in the wilderness. Why is the Lord taking us into that land? We will be killed in battle and our wives and children will be captured. Wouldn't it be better to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Oh, dear me. It's an old, old story again, isn't it? Then Moses and Aaron bowed to the ground in front of all the people. And Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, two of the spies, tore their clothes in sorrow and said to the people, the land we explored is an excellent land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will take us there and give us uh, that rich and fertile land. Do not rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people who live there. We will conquer them easily. The Lord is with us and has defeated the gods who protected them, so don't be afraid. God did what? Defeated the gods. gods who protected them so that don't be afraid. What was the thinking back in those days? If one nation beats another nation, it's because their God is stronger than the God of the poorer nation, the weaker nation, right? Yeah. That was the thinking. So what did the, what did the leaders say to the people? Look, God has defeated their gods already. Yeah. See? The whole community was threatening to stone them to death, but suddenly the Lord, suddenly the people saw the dazzling light of the Lord's presence appear over the tent. Boom! <laughs> Just wow. Okay, go ahead, Jim. You can read the next paragraph. That's read the part from Ellen White now. The faithful spies were the loud. unfaithful. The unfaithful spies were loud in denunciation of Caleb and Joshua, and the cry was raised to stone them. The insane mob seized missiles with such which to slay them, excuse me, to slay those faithful men. They rushed forward with yells of madness. Then suddenly the stones dropped from their hands. A hush fell upon them and they shook with fear. God had interposed to check their murderous design. The glory of his presence, like a flaming light, illuminated the tabernacle, and the people beheld the sign of the Lord, a mightier one than they had revealed himself, and none dared continue their resistance. The spies who brought the evil report, crouched, terror-stricken, with the bated breath, sought their and with bated breath sought their tents. Yes. Yeah. Patriarchs and Prophets, three ninety, paragraph two. And what happened to them a little bit later? I, guess, I think we're going to talk about that. It is clear that even though they were ready to stone Moses, Caleb, and Joshua, the real rebellion was against God, God himself. Carrie? Numbers 14, verses 11 through 12. You can see we're just following through the text here. We're reading the story and following along, seeing what we can learn from this story step by step. Yes. The Lord said to Moses, How much longer will these people reject me? How much longer will they refuse to trust in me, even though I have performed so many miracles among them? I will send an epidemic and destroy them, but I will make you the father of a nation that is larger and more powerful than they are. Wow. And he's saying this to who? To Moses. Go back there. Who is he talking to? Yeah. yeah. The Lord said to Moses. So what's the Lord proposing now? Well, we back up. It says he's going to send a, a God. It says that God said, I'll send an epidemic to destroy him. Mm -hmm. it, could have, it could be translated, I will permit yeah. a disease. Well, the, the point is, is, he's saying, Moses, would you like me just to destroy yeah. these people? I'll make a great nation out of you. Yeah. A few generations hence. Remember that God already knew that he soon would be bringing Moses up to heaven to live there forever. 
So he was testing Moses to demonstrate to the universe what kind of person Moses really was. Okay, so important point here. What's happening? God says he hasn't told anybody yet, yeah. but God knows that he's planning to take this same Moses after he's buried him and raised him top of Mount Nebo. He's going to take him to heaven. Yeah. And he doesn't want the people up in heaven having any question about what kind of person is this is going to show up in heaven. Yeah. So how, what's he going to do? What's he, what's he testing him? Why didn't Moses jump at the opportunity to be the father of a new nation? Wasn't that what he was trained for in Egypt? What about that? Wasn't that, I mean, he was trained to be the Pharaoh, the next Pharaoh, right? Yes. This is a very important response on the part of Moses. Okay, Numbers 14, 13 to 19. But Moses said to the Lord, you brought these people out of Egypt by your power. When the Egyptians hear that you have done what you have done to your people, they will tell it to the people who live in the land. These people have already heard that you, Lord, are with us, that you are plainly seen when your cloud stops over us, and that you go before us in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill all your people, this is Moses talking to God. Now, if you kill all your people, the nations who have heard of your fame will say that you killed your people in the wilderness because you were not able to bring them into the land you promised to give them. Now, what did we say a little bit ago? If two nations are fighting each other... Our more powerful God. The, the nation that wins, they have a more powerful God, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what are people going to think of the true God now? If this happens, he's a wimp. He's a wimp. Um, so now, Lord, I pray, show us your power and do what you promised when you said, I, the Lord, am not easily angered, and I show great love and faithfulness and forgive sin and rebellion. Yet I will not fail to punish children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation for the sins of their parents. And now, Lord, according to the greatness of your unchanging love, Forgive, I pray, the sin of the, these people, just as you have forgiven them ever since they left Egypt, from our Good News Bible. So, Moses is concerned about what? God's reputation. God's reputation. How often are you and I concerned about God's reputation? That is the central core issue in the great controversy. Yeah. Do we understand that? Moses proves himself to be a true friend of God and the onlooking universe rejoices. It's interesting to note in this context that Moses intercedes for the people just as Jesus intercedes for us every day. When an intercessor prays for someone, God can step in and do things that he could not do. In the face of Satan's opposition, if no one were praying for them. And I'm going to stop for just a second and tell you about a personal story. I uh, one time was attending uh, some classes at Johns Hopkins University. It's a university, as many of you know, a, a large national university here in the United States. I was taking a course in public health. And at the end of the first quarter, the one of our lab teachers invited all of us in the lab to come to his house on Saturday night to just get better acquainted. I got there, found out that it was actually a, sort of a, you know, a beer party, or not really a beer party, but whatever you wanted to drink. Well, of course, we got uh, soda, but so forth. And then he started to introduce me around to, my wife was with me, around to all these people. We got over to the fourth last group of people that we were just being introduced to, and one of them I knew because she was one of our teachers. But the other lady, I, I think I'd seen her before, but I didn't know. as soon as she, he finished introducing us, she turned to me and she said, do you consider yourself to be a missionary? And I had just come back for four years in Zambia, so I must have said something about having worked in Zambia, something like this. Anyway, she's, and I said, that's, that's not an easy question. I mean, that depends on what you mean by missionary. He says, I, I, don't, I don't want to beat around the bush here. I want you to, do you think you are missionary? Well, I just come back from four years of working in Zambia. I said, well, yeah, I think so. He says, well, I have a question for you. 
and this is, fits right with our lesson right here. She says, if a person knows somebody, has a personal friend, actually it turns out that it was uh, one of her nephews, that's 500 miles away, is in a terrible car accident, and they're unconscious in the hospital, you can't go there yourself, you can't do anything for them personally. If you pray for them, will it do any good? That's our question right here. Yeah. I said, that's not an easy question. Immediately she said, I know the answers to the easy questions. <laughs> that was her immediate, immediate response. I says, well, let me explain to you. And I started to explain to her about the great controversy and how God can do certain things if, if people are asking him to do that he couldn't do if people are not asking him. And later I found out that, well, I should say that he ended up, she ended up being one of a, ended up becoming an Adventist and joining becoming faculty in one of our universities. Yeah. And uh, later she told me, she says, she had asked that same question for seven years to anybody that he shot and, and knew anything at all about religion. I was the first person who gave her a reasonable answer. That's right, yeah. So here it is. God is forgiveness personified. He promises to forgive the children of Israel he promised to give the, forgive the children of Israel, but forgiveness doesn't solve the problem. They had to live with the consequences of their rebellion. That is always true. Sinning leaves scars. God may forgive us, he, all, he does, but the scars are still there. Where are we? Jim, I think. Numbers 14, excuse me, Numbers 14, 20 to 23. The Lord answered, I will forgive them as you have asked, but I promise that as surely as I live and as surely as my presence fills the earth, none of these people will live to enter that land. They have seen the dazzling light of my presence and the miracles that I have performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but they have tried my patience over and over and have refused to obey me. They will never enter the land which I promised to their ancestors, none of those who have rejected me will ever enter it. And it says obey. So yeah. I prefer to substitute the word listen. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Does God sound a little petulant there, a little bit like a someone who's... Well, God continued to support them cared for them for 38 more years, protecting them from snakes, Deuteronomy 8.15. But the real problem was that they did not have enough faith to enter the land of Canaan and allow God to conquer the land for them. So God could not take them in. And unfortunately, later, they made the big mistake of saying, we don't want God to do it for us. We want to do it ourselves with our swords because we want people to think we're powerful and we're mighty. That is so sad. So sad. I mean, why, why not let God have the, have the, you know, the, 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 the glory and the power because he's the one who does it anyway. Yeah. So what should we learn from these lessons? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 11. I'm going to put that up on the screen. I think we should read that. Carrie? I want you to remember, my brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. They were all under the protection of the cloud and all passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses. All ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. Okay, this is one of the most important verses in the entire Bi of Tri New Testament to support the idea that who was the God of the Old Testament? Jesus. Christ. Christ. Yeah. Christ. Technically not Jesus, because he became well, Jesus after he was born, but yes. The Christ. The Christ, exactly. The anointed one. Okay, go ahead. But even then, God was not pleased with most of them, and so their dead bodies were scattered over the desert. Keep going? Yeah. Now, all this is an example for us, to okay. warn us not to desire evil things as they did. All of this is what? An example for us. Go ahead. For the purpose of education, is it not? Yeah. Uh, 
evil things as they did, nor to worship idols as some of them did. As the scripture says, the people sat down to a feast which turned into an orgy of drinking and sex. We must not be guilty of sexual immorality as some of them were. And in one day, 23,000 of them fell dead. We must not put the Lord to the test as some of them did, and they were killed by snakes. We must not complain as some of them did, and they were destroyed by the angel of death. All these things happened to them as examples for others, and they were written down as a warning for us. For we live at a time when the end is about to come. Okay, three times he said now in these verses that these things happened to them for what reason? An example for us. Yes. Okay. Then he goes on to say that all these things happened to them as examples for others and so forth, written down for us. All through history, Satan has been throwing his temptations at God's people from every direction. In the ancient wilderness, it was a lack of water. On other occasions, a lack of meat to eat. We've already read about that story. And that wasn't the last time. Remember that thing we skipped over another time they had that whole story all over again, complaining about no, no, no meat to eat. In our day, it is a barrage of media. Evil forms of entertainment thrust themselves at us from every direction. Satan tries to sell us pornography as love and materialism as the answer to our problems. Do we, need more, do we need more of God's influence in our lives? Or do we just need to be a bit fitter, a younger, more affluent, a bit sexier? Would that take care of all of our problems? Well, Carrie's smiling, I see. I don't think so. The Israelites then made a terrible mistake. Jim? Numbers 14, verses 39 to 45. When Moses told the Israelites that the Lord had said, they mourned bitterly. Early the next morning, they started out to invade the hill country, saying, now we are ready to go to the place which the Lord has told us about. We admit that we have sinned. But Moses said, then, why are you disobeying the Lord now? Why do you not want why don't you want to listen? Yeah. You will not succeed. Don't go. The Lord is not with you and your enemies will defeat you. When you face the Amalekites and the Canaanites, you will die in battle. The Lord will not be with you because you have refused to follow him. Yet they still dared to go up into the hill country even though neither the Lord's covenant box nor Moses had le left the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived there attacked and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hormah. Good Okay, by. so think about the situation. These, and you, and you remember the story later, uh, well, we know that when God was with them, they were invincible. And, and, and when God wasn't with them, they, it was a ter every time it was a, tor a terrible defeat. And now, oh boy, that this terrible presumption ended up being very costly. Up to that point, the nations around had looked upon the children of Israel as being divinely guided and invincible. If they saw the Israelites coming, they just ran. They could have just marched into the land. It, back in Exodus 23, it says, I will send the hornets ahead of you. They would have just run away. They had conquered the powerful Amalekites with almost no effort. Remember Moses being holding his arm up back there. Um, the tribes in Canaan were very worried. Compare the testimony of Rahab 40 years later. But when they tried to attack the southern flanks of Canaan without God's help, they lost terribly. And suddenly the peoples in Canaan lost their fear of God's direction of the Israelites. But God had forgiven them. Wasn't that enough? Gary? Now they seem sincerely to repent of their sinful conduct, but they sorrowed because of the result of their evil course rather than from a sense of their ingratitude and disobedience. When they found that the Lord did not relent in his decree, their self-will again arose and they declared that they would not return into the wilderness. In commanding them to retire from the land of their enemies, God tested their apparent submission and proved that it was not real. 
They knew that they had deeply sinned in allowing their rash feelings to control them and in seeking to slay the spies who had urged them to obey God. That they were only terrified to find what they had made a fearful that they had made a fearful mistake. Sorry, the consequence of which proved disastrous to themselves. Their hearts were unchanged, and they only needed an excuse to occasional occasion a similar outbreak. This presented itself when Moses, by the authority of God, commanded them to go back into the wilderness. That's from Mrs. White on Patriarchs and Prophets, page 391. Wow. Just think about that. I mean, yeah. when he wants them to go in, they won't go in. When he wants them to go back, they, want, they don't want to go back. I mean, this is... I mean, you can't describe this in any way except just pure rebellion. Yes. But faith is in no sense allied to presumption. Which is this faith or presumption? It's going on here. Presumption. Only he who has true faith is secure against presumption. For presumption is Satan's counterfeit of faith. Faith claims God's promises and brings forth fruit in obedience. They listened. Presumption also claims the promises, but uses them, as Satan did, to excuse transgression. Faith would have led our first parents to trust the love of God and to obey his commands. Presumption led them to transgress his law, believing that this great, his great love would save them from the consequence of their sin. It is not faith that claims the favor of heaven without con complying with the conditions on which the mercy is to be granted. Genuine faith has its foundation in the promises and provisions of the scriptures. Desire of Ages 126, paragraph 1. A very important lesson that we need to learn from the experience of the Israelites is that when they went to war with God's guidance, notice that, with God's guidance, they were incredibly successful, invincible. But when they went to war without God's guidance, they suffered disastrous defeats. Disastrous defeats. I mean, we could number all the way through the Old Testament this was true. Yeah. This experience was just the beginning of a long history. It is important for us to remember that even when experiencing God's forgiveness, we must often still live with the consequences of our sins. It's so, uh, it's so easy for people in our day to say, all you need is just God's forgiveness. Yeah, you can have God's forgiveness. It doesn't change the fact that you still have to live with the consequences of what you did. Yeah. Well, so many of the translation, Bible translations now are using the word forgiveness rather than remission like the mm. King James uses. If, if you look at sin as it like a disease, forgiveness is really now what you're in need of. You need healing. Which, and the healing is to change your, the way of thinking, the way you approach mm -hmm. God. How many of us become restless because things are not moving in the right direction and as fast as we think they should? Is God the one at fault? Before the children of Israel had gotten to Mount Sinai, after leaving Egypt, they were already complaining. Exodus 16.3. Jim. And said to them, We wish that the Lord had killed us in Egypt. There we could at least sit down and eat meat as much as other food as we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve us all to death. Good news. Wow. Bible. They, they hadn't even got to Mount Sinai yet. <laughs> Considering everything that God was doing and had, and had done for them, why couldn't they trust him? Are we prone to forget all that God has done for us in the past, is doing for us in the present, and will do for us in the future? Carrie, you want to take this next one on? Yeah. They forgot their bitter service in Egypt. They forgot the goodness and power of God displayed in their behalf in their deliverance from bondage. They forgot how their children had been spared when the destroying angel slew all the firstborn of Egypt. They forgot the grand exhibition of divine power at the Red Sea. They forgot that while they had crossed safely in the path that had opened for them, 
the armies of their enemies attempting to follow them had been overwhelmed by the waters of the sea. They saw and felt only their present inconveniences and trials, and instead of saying, God has done great things for us, whereas we were slaves, he is making us a great nation. They talked of the hardness of the way and wondered when their weary pilgrimage will end. That's from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 293. Okay, wow. The Israelites were... Do we, do we ever... Uh, let me ask a couple, a couple of questions. We've just got a moment or two left, but think about that. You know, all the things. Instead of standing back, look, taking a broader picture, all they could think of is, oh, okay, what's happening to me right now? Yeah. What's happening right now? I'm hungry. I don't have enough water to drink. Oh, dear. I, maybe I'm going to die right here. You know, wow. The Israelites were acting like little children who demanded it to have their wants and needs met immediately. Every day, the children of Israel were eating the manna provided by God. Didn't at least some of them recognize this incredible miracle for all that it should have meant to them? Didn't they realize that if God could meet their physical needs with bread from heaven, that he could take care of them even in conquering, in conquering the land? Why was it so easy for them to become restless and rebellious? Why were they so ungrateful? Try to place yourself among the people who received the report of the spies coming back to Canaan. How do you think you would have responded? God, through Moses, had led them up to that point, and they had repeated evidences that God was the one leading them and not Moses. Why couldn't they learn from that fact? One more comment from Ellen White. Do we well be, to be thus unbelieving? Why should we be ungrateful and distrustful? Jesus is our friend. All heaven is interested in our welfare and our anxiety and fear grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We should not indulge in a solicitude that only frets and wears us but does not help us to bear trials. No place should be given to that distrust of God which leads us to make preparation against future want the chief pursuit of life as though our happiness consisted in these earthly things it is not the will of god that his people should be weighed down with care patriarchs and prophets 294 are we prepared to trust god what do you think considering all the evidence we have laid out before us in scripture and the writings of ellen white and our own personal experiences with his care. I mean, how much do we have laid out before us? We have the entire Bible, not only the Old Testament, but the New Testament, and our own personal experiences. Will we make the mistake of being restless and rebellious? Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to draw near to you and claim your blessings each day all the things that you do for us, the life and health which you give us. We have survived through a pandemic, and yet we're doing well. Um, we, don't even, we, we, we don't even begin to understand all the things you do for us, all the things you protect us from, etc. And now it's so easy for us, like these people of old, of old, to let each little bump in the road seem like an insurmountable problem. Help us not to make that mistake, but to, to, to rise above them and to see the larger pictures, our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.